evening. Welcome back to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're glad you're here with us. We're going live stream again for the second week in a row. And I know last week we had a little bit of a technical difficulty. If you remember, you were watching and uh, it was kind of funny that the, the part that got left out of the sermon was uh, the part where I was talking about wives submitting to the husbands. And uh, of all the things that get left out, it was pretty funny. I've been joking about it uh, this week around the staff and things like that. And so I debated on just preach a whole sermon on that. I know all the wives and ladies would love that, but uh, we're going to be moving on in our in our series with Colossians. In fact, we're going to uh, finish up our series on Colossians tonight, and so we're so glad that you're here with us and, and uh, looking forward to being back together. Uh, but for now, tonight, we're going to live stream this. And so if you have your Bibles, open up to Colossians chapter 4. We're going to be discussing the believer's speech. And over the last few weeks, we've seen that uh, uh, we know that Paul is in prison writing this. And what he's doing, he, he laid out a defense for the false teachers. And he kind of went over some things of how to work uh, in your marriage and your uh, parenting, uh, your work relationship. And now Paul kind of shifts a little bit and he goes to our speech, the things that we say. And uh, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, a lot you could tell about a person by the way they talk. You know, we here in Texas, we have accents. I remember I lived in, in Ohio for about 10 years, and uh, I say y'all a lot, and that's kind of a Texas thing, and they don't say that a whole lot up there, and I would always get made fun of. Uh, things that I would say, uh, a little bit of a, a Texan accent on some things, and uh, as you could tell that, you know, different people are from different parts of the world or the different parts of the country by their accent. And there's a lot you could tell uh, about their knowledge of a subject, you know, I, people know a lot about guns or sports or things like that, and they talk about it a lot, and you can tell just by listening to them that they know what they're talking about. But as a Christian, uh, we know that we can tell a lot about our speech. You know, the Lord has uh, given us a, a very amazing thing in the gift of communication. You look at animals, and, and animals can communicate with each other. You know, dogs can bark at each other, and, you know, dolphins can make that crazy dolphin sound to each other that I can't make, but... Uh, you know, they really can't communicate deeply like humans can. That's a gift that God has given us, and, and primarily that's done through spoken word. And you know, we have things like sign language for those uh, that, that can't speak or can't hear, and, and uh, God has blessed us with those things as well. But here in Scripture, we're going to find uh, what the Bible says, that, that we can, uh, how we can praise the Lord with our tongue, with our speech. And I love what uh, John MacArthur says. Uh, I found this uh, quote from him. And he says, speech will reflect the kind of person one is. Because the tongue can speak so easily and is difficult to control, a person's speech becomes the truest indicator of his spiritual state. You know, we look at that and we know that the Bible talks a lot about our tongue. We, uh, in James, we find that different parts of Scripture, uh, it speaks the way uh, to the, the loss and the, the saved communicate. We, we can talk to each other, we communicate with each other. But as a Christian, is there something different about my life, about my speech that should stand out? We know as a Christian, our marriages should be different. We talked about that yes, or last week. We talked about the, the fact that our, our work relationship with our boss and our employees is different. Our families are different with our, our parents and our kids. And so as a Christian, is my speech that different, or should it be different? Well, I think that God has definitely given us some uh, information here in, in Colossians chapter 4. And uh, Paul gives us three ways that we can communicate and praise the Lord with our speech. And so the first thing is uh, praying. God has given us the, the, the ability to, to pray. Look at verse 2 and 3. It says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God may would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. And so the first thing we see under praying is faithful. How can I be uh, faithful in my praying? He says to continue in prayer. And that word continue means to be steadfast and devoted. You know, too often we pray occasionally when we think about it or when we think we want God to bless us with something, right? We've all been there. Uh, we want God to get us out of trouble. And so what do we do? Well, we say, God, please fix this situation that I'm in. Please take care of this. And we know the first... Thessalonians 5.17, it says to pray without ceasing. And with that, you know, we get the picture, and you tell a little kid that, they, they kind of imagine, how can I pray all the time with my head bowed and my eyes closed? And we know that's not the case. You can be in continual 
uh, communication and prayer with the Lord without bowing your head, without closing your eyes. You can uh, be driving and doing all kinds of things and still having a conversation with the Lord and being in prayer. And, and in this, you know, we ask the question, why doesn't God just tell us to pray for something once and he would take care of it? Uh, you know, could he do that? Of course he could. He's God. And, and so I think what uh, the main thing to realize here is that by telling us to continue to pray, we build our relationship with him. God could have set it up to where he says, listen, I, need, I know what you're thinking. You don't even have to pray it. If you'll just think it, I'll take care of it. But God says, no, I want you to continue in prayer. And by doing so, our relationship is going to be strengthened with each other. And so our praying ought to be faithful. It also ought to be watchful. Look at verse 2. He says, and watch, and the same with thanksgiving. Uh, this word watch means to be awake and alert. And our immediately our, our minds kind of go to Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus told the disciples to watch and to pray. And the word watch is the same word used here. And, you know, in Matthew 26, it was more of the, uh, the being physically awake. But here, we see that it's more of a spiritual aspect of always seeing what we could pray about. There, there's always uh, something we could pray about, we can find. I love what one author says. He says, we will never persistently pray for something we are not concerned about. And so we take a step back and we say, am I concerned about the things going around me? Am I Am I praying enough? Am I asking the Lord to reveal things to me to pray about? And uh, we know that we're to be faithful, watchful, and also thankful. He says to, to watch in the same with thanksgiving. In fact, Philippians 4, verse 6, it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You know, it's easy to throw ourselves uh, a pity party. And to not be thankful. You know, we all have a list of things that we don't like about our life, don't we? We all have things that, uh, that we can sit back and say, I don't like this. You know, I don't like the things going on uh, with the coronavirus. My, I've lost my job. My, my job has been shut down for a few months. Um, you know, I, the list goes on and on. And if we're not careful, the temptation would be to throw ourselves a pity party. Right? There's things that we all have things in our life that we don't like. But in Philippians, it says to, to be careful for nothing, but everything give thanks, right? And everything that we have in our life, God says to find something to be thankful and let your request be made known unto God. But when this happens, uh, thank him for the good things in your life. Uh, right now, we're, you know, like I said, with the, the coronavirus and everything going on, there's, there's things obviously in all of our lives that we don't like. I don't like the fact that I, I'm preaching to a camera and that no one's in the auditorium except for some people in the sound booth. It's kind of weird. I don't like it. But, uh, but you know what? The Lord is blessed and God has allowed us to do this. And so we can look on the bright side. And when this happens, to think about the good things. Think about how God has blessed us. Think about how God has blessed you and your family and where you'd be without him. Probably not in a very good spot, would you? I know I look at my life and I know where I would be without the Lord. It would not be a good spot in my life. And, and I'm so thankful for what he has done for me. And it's also interesting to remember where Paul is writing this from. Remember, Paul's in prison. And of all the things Paul could be writing, it's not complaining. It's not about uh, griping about the prison food and how it's not very good and things like that. He's thanking the Lord for the opportunity to pray. And he's encouraging others to pray as well. And the last thing under our prayer, it needs to be purposeful. Purposeful. Look at verse 3. He says, with all praying also for us. And that word praying, or that term praying for us, uh, we see that Paul was asking for prayers. And nothing wrong with asking people to pray for you. And here when we get back to church, we'll be able to have our normal Wednesday night prayer request time. You know, you know we sit here, we, we share prayer requests. Pastor gets up here and shares things that are going on. We take a time and we set aside a time to pray for each other whether it be health needs or salvation needs of friends and loved ones. Uh, and those are great things. That's a biblical thing to do that God allows us to do with the communication of speech. But we need to pray uh, for a purpose and with a purpose. It's not just asking God to do some random thing in our life. And the question is, how do I know what to pray for? I love what Warren Wiersbe says. He says, prayer is asking God for, uh, which, uh, for that which he wants to do and give according to his will. 
And so when we pray, it's not just begging God to do something for us selfishly. We're seeking God's will. And we say, God, I want you to do something uh, in my life, in this, in this world. I want it to be your will to be done. And if at all possible, make this happen. God, I'm beseeching you and your will. That's how we pray. And as, as we read his word and have sweet fellowship with him, we discover his will and we do it in our lives. And so the more we pray, the more God reveals to us and we strengthen that relationship. So it's very important uh, to have the speech of prayer in our lives. And the second thing is proclaiming the word. Proclaiming the word. Look at verse 3 and 4. He says, With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it my manifest as I ought to speak. And so a couple of things we see that Paul is praying for and praying about. And the first one is praying for an open door. Uh, praying for an open door. And this wasn't a physical door of the prison to be opened. I'll be honest, if I was in prison and uh, I was uh, praying for an open door, I would want it to be the physical door of the prison. I would want to get out of there. I'm pretty sure they designed prisons to not be very fun and, and you know, exciting to be in. And so everybody wants to get out. But it's interesting, you know, all the letters that Paul has written from prison, uh, all the things he wrote, it was never for his personal concern. Not one time that he said, hey, come bust me out of here, you know, uh, bake me a cake with a file in it type thing and, and help me get out of this prison. It's no, Paul writes these letters and he's caring for others. He is constantly witnessing to other people and, and sharing the gospel. And with that, we see the faith of Paul. And I ask myself the question, when is the last time that I got to witness to somebody, to share the gospel, to proclaim the word? And, you know, I think a lot of us, just like me, you know, we have excuses, don't we? We have an excuse for everything. We make up reasons why we can't do something. God gives us specific directions to go share the gospel, to to proclaim his word, to to preach or to teach, and to share the good news with other people. And what do we do? We say, oh, they don't want to hear that. Uh, that I don't even know what to say. And we somehow find a way to, to get out of it, don't we? We say, God, give me, give me a way to serve you today. Give me a way to, uh, to proclaim your word, and God does it, and we kind of chicken out. Uh, we've all been there. Uh, you know, Satan convinces us that, that nobody wants to hear it, and then we would just mess it up. And uh, that's just not the case. God tells us to do it. But have you ever had the opportunity to share the gospel and you didn't do it? And you get home or, you know... You, and an hour later, you think back to that situation, and how do you feel? Horrible, right? We've all been there. Uh, God, is, you know, God has placed someone in our life to, to share the good news, to share Scripture with them, to kind of uh, give our testimony, and we don't do it, and we, and we blow it. We, we've all been there. But I know that Paul never wanted to go through that feeling. Uh, Paul never wanted that to be said of him, that he, he, he had the opportunity uh, to, to share the gospel, to proclaim the word of the Lord and not do it. Paul never wanted to go through that feeling. You know, it's during this time in prison where, uh, where Paul wrote Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. Uh, and so it's amazing that God can use such a horrible time in someone's life, uh, such as prison, to produce such good fruit from that. And while the open door, physically of the open door, wasn't there in the prison, uh, there was a huge open door uh, to share the gospel. And the one other thing he was praying about, he says, uh, to speak the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ. Now, mystery is, uh, it refers to something hidden in the Old Testament, but now revealed in the New Testament. And it's referring to the gospel. You know, you look all throughout the Old Testament, we see everything pointing to the need for a Savior. You go all the way back to the garden to where mankind chooses to sin. And God says, hey, now there's going to be a plan set in place. There will be a Savior to come. You read all throughout all the Old Testament, everything pointing to the cross of Jesus Christ. All the, all the prophecies, everything that came true when the Lord Jesus Christ came and he, and he died for our sins and he was buried and rose again. And everything came true. But in the New Testament, we see that the Savior is revealed. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the, the central theme of, of the, the Bible is the, this mystery of Christ in the Old Testament. Now this is revealed, and because of Paul being in prison, we see that he's able to share the gospel with people he never would have met. 
Um, I'm sure Paul never planned on meeting prison guards. Uh, hopefully I never plan on meeting any prison guards outside or inside of prison. I'm sure they're great people, but I don't want to meet them in prison. I'd rather meet them at Walmart or at church or something like that, right? But Paul was able to meet these people and to share the gospel. In fact, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn back to Philippians chapter 1 in verses 12 to 14. Philippians 1, 12 to 14, uh, Paul kind of lays out uh, some things that have happened because of him being in prison and him being able to get the gospel out to people he would never normally get to see. Philippians 1, verse 12, he says, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And what a testimony of Paul to realize that he, he's physically chained to these guards. And you can imagine being the guards uh, designed or, or, you know, having the, uh, the job to be uh, chained next to Paul. Do you think he shared the gospel with him? Of course he did, probably over and over again. And he kept talking about the Lord and praying and singing and doing all those things. Uh, talk about a captive audience. And yet, instead of Paul complaining, he realized he had this open door to share the mystery of Christ with these people. And because of that, the Bible says that more and more people heard of this and they became more confident. It's encouraging to see someone remaining faithful in their walk. I mean, just think of someone in your life. Maybe it's going on in this uh, coronavirus pandemic and you see someone that's uh, struggling uh, financially, maybe their, their job has been, maybe they've lost their job or they've been cut back on hours, and yet, and, and yet their, their faith seems stronger than ever. It's, very, it's a very confident thing, and it's, it's exciting for me as a Christian to see those things, and it's encouraging to know that God is still at work in people's lives, even in a scary time like this. And, and so we need to realize that we can be that for other people as well. Even in a scary time, people are looking at us, and here in a second we're going to talk about that, uh, but the world needs to hear the gospel, and, and especially now more than ever. And if we don't share it with them, who will? I want you to let that, that you know, kind of sink in. If I don't share the gospel uh, with, with my family, with my parents, uh, with my aunts and uncles, with my neighbor, who's going to do it? I might never meet them. Pastor may never meet them. God has given them to you to share that with. God's given you that open door of you living next to them, of you being in the same family, to share that mystery of Christ with them. And so I want to encourage you to, uh, to take every chance you can whenever we're, we get the chance to proclaim the word. God has given you this ability to communicate and to speak and, and use other tools to share the gospel, but it only works if we do it. It doesn't do us any good if we don't really do the hard work of doing it. And so the third thing is witnessing. We know that God has given us communication. God expects us to, uh, to praise him with our speech. We can do that in our praying, in our proclaiming the word, and also in our witnessing. Look at verse 5 and 6. He says, To walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you answer or ought to answer every man. Now, a couple of phrases here. The first one, to them that are without. Uh, this term means outsiders. If you look it up, that's what that means. It means outsiders. Those who are not a part of the family of God. Those who are not saved. And, um, you know, the, Paul says that unbelievers are watching us. He says to, to walk in wisdom toward them that are without. And the vast majority of people you're going to meet in this world are people that fit that category. That are to them that are without. They're not a part of the family of God. And since we claim to be a part of God's family, shouldn't there be a difference about my life? Should there be a difference in my speech, the way I conduct myself? And our responsibility, the Bible says, is to walk in wisdom. And so what does that look like? You know, well, how can I walk in wisdom in front of people that I know aren't saved, that they would look at me and say there's something different about, about this person's life? A couple, you know, a couple things to kind of give you. Um, the first one I would say is not to do anything or say anything that would make it difficult to share the gospel. You know, lots of people argue about, hey, is this thing a sin? Is this okay to do that? And you know what? There's a lot of things that we can do. We have the liberty of, of, in Christ to do those things. 
But if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of times we, we don't think about the stumbling block that we become. Uh, our neighbors are watching us. Our family that knows that we're Christians, are, they're watching us. And, and so why would I want to do something or say something that would potentially damage the chance of me giving the gospel to those people? And so we need to, we need to be careful of the things that we say, the, the places we go, the things that we do, all those things to make it difficult to share the gospel. Man, a big thing, uh, uh, working, paying your bills, and just being a good citizen, that goes a long way. Um, that would kind of fall into the, the, the category of, you know, I can say I love the Lord, but I don't want to pay my bills. Or I say I love the Lord, but I don't want to take care of my civic duty to, to go to work and things like that. Uh, keeping your family in order, having a good home life, having a good testimony that matches our claims. You ever met someone that they say one thing and does the, other, does the opposite? Of course we have. They're hypocrites. And, and so I know that as a Christian, uh, we're not perfect. I, I teach and preach Jesus Christ, and I tell people, hey, you've got to be saved, and you've got to live for the Lord, and you've got to do all these things. But I, I fail daily just like you do. But hopefully when people look at my life, there's a, there's a pattern of, of godliness, and, and I try my best to serve the Lord. So when I do witness to people, it doesn't go on deaf ears of people saying, ah, that's just talk. He doesn't really live that way. And so that's our goal is, is to live the way that we talk. Another phrase he uses here is redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. That's in verse 5. And it means to make the most out of every opportunity. Every opportunity. And what's interesting, we know that, that we have lots of different resources. We have all kinds of money and things like that. But time is a non-renewable resource. You can always make more money, but you can't make more time. Once it's gone, it's gone. And imagine if someone came to you and said, look, I'm going to give you $1,440 to spend every day for the rest of your life. Man, that would be great, wouldn't it? What would you spend? You know, with all the stimulus check talk and all that kind of stuff is out there. What would you do if you got all this money? But the key is uh, they said, I'll give you $1,440 every day for the rest of your life, but you can't save it. And if you don't spend it, it is, it's gone. You have to spend it every day. And there's nothing else you can do with it. How would you spend it? The thing is, God gives us 1,440 minutes every day. And the key is, you have to spend it. You can't save it. You can't save it till tomorrow. You can't, you, you know, you can't roll over like you can you know, cell phone minutes like you could back in the day. Uh, you get a certain amount every day, and that's it, whether you spend them the right way or the wrong way. And once they're gone, they're gone. And so what are you doing with your time? What am I doing with my time? We don't have yesterday's time. It's gone. We've all got things in our past we wish were different. We've all got things, maybe even yesterday, maybe you did something like, man, I I can't believe I did that. I told myself I would never do that again. And it's gone. And you wish you can go back and fix it. But you can't. That time is spent. And it's non-renewable. But the key is, what am I going to do with the 1,440 minutes that God has given me today? Am I going to redeem the time? I love what uh, in, in Psalm 90 verse 12 says, Moses wrote this actually, Psalm 90 verse 12. He says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Man, what a, what a great verse. I know you've probably heard that. Teach us to number our days so we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And he goes on to say that there's really three things we can add to our speech here. He kind of gives us three different things that we can look at. And the first one is adding sweetness, which is grace. Look at verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace. Um, Luke 4, verse 22 says, And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded, proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and you look back in Luke chapter 4 there, if I want to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ, how can I affect, how can I do that with my speech? And here's something amazing that people notice about the Lord Jesus Christ. While on earth, they, they wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. One thing that stood out about Jesus is the way he talked, the things that he said. Now, I realize that he is God, and so whatever he says is true, and he cannot sin. But do people say that about us? When they see us, oh, man, the, the gracious words that come out of that person's mouth. Sometimes 
Uh, I'll be honest, that doesn't, you can't say that of me, right? Uh, I'm sure the same thing goes for you. At work, do people say that? In your house, can your family say that? About the gracious words that come out of your mouth. You know, if you're struggling about the way you talk, the things that come out of your mouth, this is a good verse to think about. And think about how the lost world responded to the words of Jesus. They were gracious and sweet words, but there was just something different about him and the way that he talked. Another thing we can add is seasoning. The Bible says in verse 6, again, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Now, salt was used as a preservative and as a seasoning. It makes a huge difference in our food, and your speech can make a big difference in this lost world. You know, salt creates thirst. We, we know what it's like to have, a, you know, a bunch of chips or, or fries or something like that, really salty. What do you want? Uh, you want something to drink or like a milkshake. I don't know why milkshakes go really well with fries and chips and stuff. I mean, milkshakes go well with everything, in my opinion. But, uh, but whenever we, we know we eat something salty, we want something uh, to drink. It creates a, a thirst. And as a Christian, uh, we know that we have what the world is looking for. Uh, this world is thirsting for truth. And as a Christian, it's our job to give it to them, and that's what we find in Scripture. It's the gospel. And, and so as we are, we're adding sweetness and we're adding seasoning to this, to this world, we know that God has given us uh, what we need to give to other people. And the last thing we can add here is adding spirit. Know how to answer every man. Look at verse 6 again, the back end. It says that you may know how you ought to answer every man. You know, the, the majority of people you meet here in this world, uh, they're going to be lost. Uh, and they're normal people. Man, people with jobs, families, hopes and dreams, and they're just looking to have a good time. And people like you and me, but except they're lost. They don't have the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have the one thing that they need in life. But they're lost, and they're on their way to hell unless we step in and say, hey, listen, I've got something for you. The Lord has, has got something for you. Jesus Christ has died for your sins. He's provided a way for, heaven, for you to go to heaven with him, but you just have to accept it. And until we step in and do that, they're not going to know. And the Bible says that we are to know how to answer every man. And are you ready to give them what they need? And the only way to do that is to study his word. You know, the, back in the 80s, Radio Shack came out with a slogan. Uh, I know Radio Shack, uh, for you younger people, is a store that used to sell like batteries and calculators and stuff. Uh, they're, they're not around anymore. I'm sure Amazon probably killed them off. But uh, uh, they would sell VCRs and things. And they had a slogan, and it says, you've got questions, we've got answers. And some of you older people might remember that. I remember it, and I'm not that old. But uh, um, uh, the world has questions. And believe it or not, Christian, you have the answers. Uh, they're, they're looking for the answers in all the wrong places in this world. They're looking at, into, into bad relationships, into drugs and alcohol, and all kinds of things out there. They're just looking uh, to fill their life with some, some positive answers to make them feel better. But as Radio Shack says, you've got questions, we've got answers. You know, as a Christian, we should say, you know what, you've got questions, and, and God's got the answers. And it's found in his word. And let me communicate the truth of the gospel to you. I love what 1 Peter 3, verse 15 says. It says, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you for your reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. Be ready to give an answer. And so this world is out there. They're, they're looking for the truth. Uh, they, they want to know the truth. A lot of them, you, know, you give it to them and they reject it. That's on them. God tells you to give the, the, the truth to them. It's their job to respond to that. But the only way to do that is to be in prayer and to be reading your Bible. Uh, to know what to give the answer. And so as we kind of wrap this up, as we've studied the, the book of Colossians, remember that Paul wrote this letter from prison. Uh, the first couple of chapters he spent kind of correcting the false teaching of the false teachers coming in. He was getting their doctrine straight. And the last couple of chapters he went on to instruct the, the young believers on how to live. There's everyday basics of life. He talked about mortifying the sins of the flesh. He said the things that you used to do that you know before you got saved, he said don't do those things anymore. And he says to, to put on the new man, the characteristics of Jesus Christ. He told us how to behave in our relationships, our marriage, our parenting, and our, our work relationships. 
And now he's told us how to, how to conduct our speech. Everything in life God has given us to do, we just have to do it. And I it, know it's easier said than done. But I want to close with this thought. It's, and it's basically this. What you believe determines how you behave. And so it's one thing to, to watch these sermons online, to kind of to read your Bible. But ultimately, if we believe this, it's going to affect the way we behave. If I truly believe that, uh, that, that I'm saved and the Lord Jesus Christ lives inside of me and he in, indwells me and, and praise the Lord, he's coming back one day to, uh, to rapture us out of here. I know this is going to happen. If I believe all that, it should change the way I behave. And the flip side is, is true as well. How you behave shows what you believe. And so you can say you love the Lord all day long, but if your speech doesn't match it, there's a problem there. And so those are things that we need to get fixed. Are you living for the Lord? Are you pointing others to him? Because as we've talked about, we need to redeem the time. You only get one shot at this life, and once it's gone, it's gone. And so hopefully this has been an encouragement to you and uh, this, this study in Colossians. But let me close out in a word of prayer and to thank the Lord for the time he's given us tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity we have to uh, just uh, meet together virtually here uh, through a live stream. We thank you for all the things you've taught us over the last few weeks of this study. We look forward to coming back together again as a body of believers. And God, as we study tonight the, uh, our speech and how, God, you've given us the ability to pray and to, to proclaim your word and also to witness, God, I pray that as, as we looked at these things that we wouldn't just agree with them on the inside, but also do it. And we know that, that what we believe determines how we behave and help us, God, to behave as Christians. Uh, we're your children and we need to act like it. And God, uh, I believe that really starts with the things that we say and the things that we, uh, the things that we do. Help us to be uh, believers that are doing your will and doing the things you've called us to do. We thank you again tonight for our time of Bible study. We look forward to meeting together this coming Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us tonight. Looking forward to meeting back here on Sunday. I know Pastor sent out uh, through Facebook and email kind of our reopening plan, so make sure to check your inbox for that. If you have any questions about this Sunday, please give us a call here at the office. We can answer any questions that you have. And so this Sunday we'll have an 8.30 and 11 o'clock service only, and so this, they will also be live streamed as well. But we are looking forward to being back together with you again. And so hope you have a great night, and we'll see you on Sunday.